Chapter 99 The Plate of the Mitre Exodus chapter 28 Verses 36 to 43 And thou shalt make a plate of pure gold, and grave upon it, like the engravings of a signet, holiness to the Lord. And thou shalt put it on a blue lace, that it may be upon the mitre, upon the forefront of the mitre it shall be. And it shall be upon Aaron's forehead, that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things, which the children of Israel shall hallow in all their holy gifts, and it shall be always upon his forehead, that they be accepted before the Lord. And thou shalt embroider the coat of fine linen, and thou shalt make the mitre of fine linen, and thou shalt make the girdle of needlework. And for Aaron's sons thou shalt make coats, and thou shalt make for them girdles, and bonnets shalt thou make for them, for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt put them upon Aaron thy brother, and his sons with him, and thou shalt anoint them, and consecrate them, and sanctify them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness from the loins even unto the thighs they shall reach. And they shall be upon Aaron and upon his sons when they come in unto the tabernacle of the congregation, or when they come near unto the altar to minister in the holy place, that they bear not iniquity and die. It shall be a statute for ever unto him and his seed after him. Exodus chapter 28, verses 36 to 43. In verse 41, as in verse 3, we have the word consecrate, and in chapter 29, we have the consecration of the priests. The Hebrew word in verse 41 for consecrate means to fill the hands, to empower and govern. In verse 3, the word used means to make or pronounce clean. In Exodus chapter 29, the former word is used. There is an implication of devotion. If we wear the uniform of a police officer, that uniform sets up certain boundaries for our behaviour. It fills our hands, that is, governs our activities. It identifies and hence limits us by governing our conduct. A major aspect of the modern desire to be both distinctive yet anonymous in dress and person has its roots in a desire to flee from responsibility and identification. There is today a hostility, for example, to clerical garb in public and to military uniforms. Uniforms of any kind identify and empower, and this is now resented. One suburban city in the early 1970s insisted on abandoning police uniforms and guns as authoritarian symbols. The results were very bad. A plate or rosette of pure gold was to be made and it was to be tied to the priestly mitre by a diadem of violet or blue lace. Thus, like a crown, the mitre and the rosette set forth the necessary dedication, holiness to the Lord. The coat, or tunic, verse 39, was the usual garment of men of rank, as was the girdle. Both were marks of authority. The linen breeches, verse 42, were what we would call underwear. The girdle, made of fine needlework, is of interest because a girdle was normally used to keep in place, during a time of work or battle, the long tunic for freer movements. 1. Girdles were less for beauty than for use. Men girded themselves for battle, for a race, for active exertion of any kind. The high priest was to have his loins continually girded that he might be ready at all times for God's service. But he was not to make a parade of this readiness. The girdle was to be hidden under the robe of the ephod. Two, hidden as it was, the girdle was to be costly and beautiful, 
of many colors, the work of the skilled embroiderer. The Israelites were taught by this that things devoted to God's service, whether they be seen or not, should be of the best. The intention is not to please men's eyes by beauty of color or form or richness of material, but to do honor to God. Scamped work in places where it is not seen has been thought allowable by many a church architect. Dust and untidiness in hidden corners are tolerated by many who have the care of sacred buildings. True piety will make no difference between the seen and the unseen, the hidden and that which is open to sight, but aim at comeliness, fitness and beauty in all that appertains to the worship of God. In verse 41, we are given three aspects of the investiture of the priests, anointing, consecration, and sanctification. First, anointing was of persons and things, to set them apart for God's purposes. It was against the law, Exodus chapter 30, verses 32 and 33, to manufacture for any other use the holy anointing oil, Such an act resulted in excommunication. The anointing of anyone or anything was an act commissioned by God and therefore his act. The word anoint was used metaphorically to signify God's blessing, as in Psalm chapter 23 verse 5. Thou anointest my head with oil, Things or persons anointed were not only set apart for God's purpose, but also sometimes received the Spirit of God in some special way. Second, consecration, as we have seen, filled the hands or empowered the anointed person for his task and fitted him for it. Third, sanctification is the making holy of that which has been set apart. God is holiness. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44, chapter 19, verse 2, etc. Holiness is in both form and content. It is outward and inward, ritual and moral. Both aspects of holiness must be manifested and maintained. There is hypocrisy in maintaining mere outward or formal holiness and disrespect and questionable holiness at best in despising the forms. In Isaiah chapter 8 verse 13 we have a statement which sheds light on the meaning of sanctification. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear and let him be your dread. God is not to be treated casually or lightly. At all times we are to remember that he is God, the Almighty, a consuming fire. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 29 A casual treatment of God is a form of disbelief. We are similarly to view all things which God sets apart for his purpose with respect, not with casualness. There are two directions to this required holiness on the part of the priests. First, that they may be accepted before the Lord. Verse 38. Moral faithfulness was mandatory for the priests, but so too was ritual holiness. Failure here meant contempt for God's simple requirements of ritual dress. Second, the priests could not represent the people unless they were first faithful to the Lord. The inscription on the mitre's gold plate thus set forth the purpose of worship, holiness to the Lord. All of man's life and the whole of creation must become holy and set apart for God's service, beginning with man. As we have seen, consecrate them in verse 41 means fill their hands. Originally and very literally, it meant fill their hands with the work of sacrifice. But sacrificial animals were not cited here, 
so that the consecration went beyond the immediate sacrifices. It is stated generally. It harkens back to God's command to Adam to obey and serve, to exercise dominion and to subdue the earth under him. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. In verse 38, we are told that exact obedience to the ritual and the wearing of the mitre are necessary in order that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things. The holy things refers to the offerings brought by the people and presented by the priests. These had to be unblemished offerings. The reference to their iniquity means that the best sacrifices are imperfect and that the best of men are not without sin and mixed motives. The high priest's careful attention to holiness was thus a means of purging the offerer and offerings from their impurities. Christ, as the perfect high priest and the representative of the new humanity, himself purges us and our gifts. Here the high priest, in his own person, stood between God and man to represent the great high priest who was to come. The temper of the 20th century is emphatically hostile to the emphasis on ritual faithfulness which marks these laws. Even in the 1930s, when a different moral atmosphere prevailed, I recall the contemptuous amusement of a Berkeley professor for his grandparents. They were, he admitted, a loving and a faithful couple, but in public they always respectfully address one another as Mr. Smith and Mrs. Smith. Formal courtesy and respect towards all, including children, was a law to them. Perhaps such formality was a bit extreme, but it did indicate respect and social grace. Children were addressed, if unrelated, as Master John or Miss Jane, or if well known as Missy. A culture which finds such older traditions amusing is not likely to respect God's sanctuary, nor likely to stress reverence, if such people know what reverence means. Formalities and rituals are a form of honour and respect, things not highly regarded in these last years of the 20th century.